After recapping our Ohm's law notes, we went on to look at resistance and resistivity. And we said the resistance of a conductor will be affected by the length of the conductor. Longer conductors have higher resistance, so shorter conductors have less resistance. The cross-sectional area will affect the resistance of a cable. The bigger the cross-sectional area, the less the resistance. The smaller the cross-sectional area, the higher the resistance. Temperature also will affect the resistance of a cable. The hotter the cable, the higher the resistance. The exception to this rule is carbon being a semiconductor, which we know from previous presentations works in the opposite way around. In other words, the hotter the carbon becomes, the better a conductor it becomes, therefore the resistance is lowered. As well as looking at length, temperature and area affecting a conductor's resistance, we also looked at its resistivity. And we said silver has a lower resistivity than copper, therefore is a better conductor. And aluminium has a higher resistivity than that of copper and silver, therefore is not as good a conductor as the other two. However, all three are widely used for different applications within the electrical industry, with copper being the most common material used in conductors. We went on to work out the resistance of a conductor by using the formula resistance equals the resistivity multiplied by the length divided by the area. In other words, resistance equals rho L over A. Again, these video presentations are to put us in the position where we get the amount of knowledge required to go into the exam where a calculator wouldn't be used. Remembering the formula, resistance is rho L over A, is a good way of getting marks within this section. I'd like to think that we can apply that formula and rearrange it to find three others, whether it be length, resistivity, or area. But again, the presentation is about that surface knowledge requiring for our principles exam. We went on to look at two statements that again appear in our exam. Resistance is proportional to length, and resistance is inversely proportional to cross-sectional area. So if I have a cable with a resistance of 10 ohms and I double its length and remeasure its resistance, its new resistance will be 20 ohms. If I take the same cable with a resistance of 10 ohms and halve its length and remeasure its resistance, its new resistance is 5 ohms. They are proportional. Double it, double the size of resistance, half, half the size of resistance. We also looked at the area of the conductor. If we were to double the area of a conductor, it has the inverse proportion. In other words, we halve its resistance. So the same cable with a resistance of 10 ohms has its cross-sectional area doubled. Sometimes the exam says double its size. Its new resistance would be 5 ohms. We went on to look at permanent magnets and magnetic fields. and They have some rules. These rules could come up as exam questions. Lines of magnetic flux flow from north to south. They take the shortest possible route from north to south. They cannot be broken, only reshaped. And magnetic flux is measured in the Weber and flux density is measured in the Tesla, which is adds two more SI units to my first presentation. We went on to say that opposite poles of a permanent magnet attract, so a north will attract a south. And like poles, so two souths, would repel each other. We also stated some of the enemies of magnets. Uh, magnetic fields can be lost or interfered with by stronger magnets, by vibration or by vast amounts of heat can affect a permanent magnet or a magnetic field. We then went on to look at electromagnets and we said that all current carrying conductors create around them a magnetic field. A magnetic field can be increased by increasing the amount of current being passed through the conductor. So Larger conductors carrying more current will create a stronger magnetic field around them. We can give that magnetic field direction if we know which way the current is flowing. And we said if the current was flowing away from us, it was like looking at the back of a dart that we'd let out of our hand and we'd thrown it aboard. We saw the cross on the back of the dart, therefore the current was flowing away from us. It creates a magnetic field around the conductor that rotates in a clockwise direction. Likewise, if the current was coming towards us or somebody had thrown a dart at us, the first thing coming towards us was a dot or a point, and that was used on a drawing to uh, suggest that the current was coming towards us, and current coming towards us would create a rotating magnetic field around the conductor that goes in an anti-clockwise direction. We then went on and look at if we had two current carrying conductors placed side by side, carrying current in differing directions, that the two conductors would repel or be pushed apart. Where we had two conductors side by side carrying current in the same direction, the two conductors would be pulled together. We then looked at how the current carrying conductor that creates a magnetic field around it can be utilised. 
In other words, if we curled that current carrying conductor into a coil, we saw that the magnetic field created around it greatly increased in strength. This is the basic principles of a solenoid. A solenoid is really just a coil of cable carrying current creating an electromagnetic field. That magnetic field can be polarized by using the right hand grip rule, where on the right hand, the fingers are the current, which direction goes, and the thumb points to the north pole. So if we've gone over the top with our current wrapped around that way, or underneath, we see how we can polarize either end of the coil to be north, um, the opposite one being south. Often in exams, they will draw a picture and ask you to polarize it. In other words, tell me which side is north using the right hand grip rule. Next, we went on to look at force on a conductor in a magnetic field. So in other words, we have a current carrying conductor creating a magnetic field placed within a magnetic field, a permanent magnetic field set up by a north and south pole and the interaction between the two. This uses Fleming's left hand rule in order to use three fingers, one for direction or movement of the conductor that's been placed into the magnetic field, one finger for the polarization of the permanent magnetic field from north to south, and one being the direction of the current within the conductor itself. And by using Fleming's left hand rule, you can work out whether the conductor's being thrown up and out of the magnetic field or down and out of the magnetic field. Again, questions in our exam like to use Fleming's left hand rule. In recent history, they've told you which hand to use when showing you a current carrying conductor placed in a magnetic field, being Fleming's left hand rule. On Fleming's left hand rule, it's also worth remembering what each of the fingers is named or doing. So in other words, the thumb is the direction, the index finger from knuckle north to south is obviously the magnetic field. So direction, magnetic field, and the finger being for the current, the direction of the current. So whether it be away or towards you. So just remembering the three fingers and what they are doing or what they're named within Fleming's left hand rule could also get us some marks in the exam. On the back of Fleming's left hand rule, we went on to look at Fleming's right hand rule. This time, We've got a conductor being placed in a magnetic field, not a current carrying conductor, a conductor. And we're going to induce an EMF into that conductor. So in other words, the basic principles of generation. And sometimes they call the Fleming's right hand rule, not necessarily just the right hand rule, but the generator, as in the right hand rule. So when you're reading a question in the exam that says a conductor is being placed in a magnetic field in order to generate an EMF, which hand will be used? It will be Fleming's right hand rule. And again, within this section, we may only be required to identify the three fingers on Fleming's right hand rule, the thumb being movement or motion, uh, the index finger being knuckle north to south being the magnetic field, and then the final finger being the induced EMF into the conductor itself. So not necessarily going to be using Fleming's right hand rule. However, the exam has had questions before where it asks you to use the right hand rule, but again, indicates to you that's the hand you should be using. But sometimes it's simply just a labeling of the fingers, motion or movement, a magnetic field from north to south and induced EMF on the right hand rule. Next thing we looked at was single loop alternators. In other words, a conductor being rotated in a magnetic field and whether we could produce AC or DC from rotating that conductor within a magnetic field. And we saw if we connected that single loop of wire to slip rings and rotated it 360 degrees through a magnetic field, we saw how we produced an AC waveform, in other words, a sine wave. One complete revolution of 360 degrees will give you a sine wave with a peak in the positive half of the cycle and a peak in the negative half of the cycle. One complete revolution is also called a period. We also looked at rotating a single conductor through a magnetic field when it was connected to a commutator. In other words, it only took the positive half of the cycle each time as it was rotated through the magnetic field. And this is the basic principles of producing DC or direct current. Again, this is only a whistle stop tour of this section of principles notes. Isn't the full underpinning knowledge. It's the surface knowledge required to enter the exam at that sort of a basic level where we're trying to progress from these uh, video presentations in order to get a distinction. But we're going in there with that surface knowledge that we understand the basic principles of magnetism and the basic understanding of resistance and resistivity will allow us to pick up marks within this section. As always, I expect you to remember everything I've taught you in the classroom. I get every single question right. But this is the sort of minimum position that we should be in going into the exam with our knowledge levels.